And welcome back to the Interfaith Roundtable. I'm Cantor Mark Perman. Happy to have you back with us. Trua, otherwise known as the Rabbinic Call for Human Rights, is an organization of rabbis and cantors from across the Jewish spectrum that seeks to act on the Jewish requirement to respect and protect the rights of all people. Many think of Judaism as a religion and ethical system just for Jews. Well, it isn't. Judaism demands not only attention to the challenges and problems of our own people, but to the cause of tikkun olam, or repairing the world for all, and to a large extent, for all living creatures. My guest is Rabbi Rachel Goldenberg, who was ordained in 2003 by Hebrew Union College Jewish Institute of Religion in New York, and she is a graduate of Columbia University. She served as co-chair for Trua, and she is a member of the Rabbinic Cabinet of J Street. She also serves on the steering committee of the Rabbinic Vision Initiative and is a member of the New Haven Board of Rabbis. In 2007, Rabbi Goldenberg was enthusiastically welcomed. I hope enthusiastically. That's what I believe I she was. was. <laughs> she was enthusiastic, <laughs> as they all were, as the spiritual leader of Congregation <clears throat> Beth Shalom, Road Fate Sedek in Chester. Welcome. Thanks for having me, Mark. It's so you have, oh, I'm glad you're here. I'm honored that you're here. You have essentially two jobs, one as a rabbi of a congregation, and secondly, with the work as Trua, how do you merge the two mm. worlds and does one complement the other? Well, Trua is a volunteer job. Oh. I am a, a longtime board member. Um, our board is made up of rabbis, mm -hmm. and um, but we're all volunteers and I was co-chair of that board for two years. So mm -hmm. um, so the way the, the my, you know, my professional job at, as a congregational rabbi comes together with the volunteer work, is that I don't sleep much, but also mm -hmm. um, I know that feeling. Yeah, <laughs> you squeeze yeah. it in. <laughs> um, but there, there are some wonderful ways um, to get congregants and lay people involved with the human rights issues that we deal with mm -hmm. um, through Chua. How do you inspire people to care about these larger human rights issues? I find that people are often concerned, as we all should be, with our own lives, our own families, our own jobs. To get them to go beyond that to the larger concerns of the world's problems is mm -hmm. not always easy. How do you do that? It's a great question. Um, I really find that the most powerful thing is stories, telling stories about mm. real people. Um, and even, you know, I, I just actually led a family education program on Shabbat on Saturday morning for our whole religious school, all the parents and all the kids ages kindergarten up through seventh grade. Um, and I was teaching them, them about the issue of modern day slavery and the abuse that's going on in the tomato picking industry in Florida. Tell people about um, that. So I'll tell people yeah. about that. But, I mean, for, but in terms of getting people connected to the issue and, and getting them excited, just showing them pictures and telling them stories um, really mm. fires people up, I think. Mm -hmm, and, mm -hmm. and it opens people's hearts to feel empathy because these are fellow human beings. So. Yeah, so the leadership has to come from you to really make people aware of. So, you know, yeah. most think that human trafficking or slavery ended in 1865. <laughs> with the uh, 13th Amendment, but that's not true. So tell people that's about that. That's not true. Um, what's really sad and very often kind of hidden, I think, from view is how very vulnerable agricultural workers are, migrant workers in particular, in this country, and always have been. And really, what I learned, I, I was in Immokalee, Florida, um, learning with the Coalition of Immokalee Workers, learning from the pickers. And I learned about the history. Um, and it turns out that really, you know, once slavery ended formally mm -hmm. um, at the end of the Civil War, it continued informally um, through sharecropping and um, you know, folks being arrested for vagrancy and then being contracted out through prison work mm. to do agricultural work for no compensation um, and, and various other forms. Until uh, today, what we have going on, it's really a spectrum of abuse and um, a lack of protections that kind of allows for a spectrum from, you know, folks being subject to verbal abuse, exposed to pesticides, sexual abuse um, in the fields, mm -hmm. um, not getting paid for all the hours that they're picking because they're sitting on a bus waiting for the dew to dry and there's no time clock. Um, maybe not getting paid full wages. You're supposed to get paid 50 cents a bucket of tomatoes, but maybe you didn't fill it 
the way that the person on the truck thinks you know they're mm. supposed to fill it they dump it out they don't pay you the 50 cents so this happens so in this country this that is happens in this country okay. and that's that's mm -hmm. one end of the spectrum but once you're allowing for those kinds of abuses to go on and there's no accountability it allows for much worse things to happen so there have been cases seven of them prosecuted um, successfully of migrant laborers um, being held against their will um, because of debts that they may owe to the grower mm -hmm. who, mm -hmm. you know, paid for them to, my, you know, immigrate whether legally or illegally. Right. So um, because they're, many are illegal, they don't have the rights that legal workers would have and therefore they can be the subject of all these abuses? Is that the It makes them it? all the more vulnerable, but mm -hmm. even people coming on worker visas to yeah. this country are subject to abuse because they're tied to a particular employer and if they don't like the work, there's nowhere for them to go. So one thing I hear sometimes is, you know, we, more progressive liberal Jews, get too concerned with the rest of the world. We should be first and foremost concerned mm. with taking care of our own mm. and of Israel and so forth. Now, you do both, you obviously, Troy is in Israel. So do you hear that argument from people sometimes? You know, why, why are you going down there? Why are you worried about them? Why don't you take care of our own people first? Um, I, I guess I don't. I, I do hear that argument here and there. Um, why is that a Jewish mission to care about other people and not just Jews. Yeah, I mean, it's such a core value in our texts and in mm -hmm. our teachings, um, and then also just our own historical experience. So, you know, we're taught in the Torah that all human beings are created in the image of God, and that, mm -hmm. that has such huge implications for how we're meant yeah. to, you know, treat others. We're told many, many times uh, to not oppress the stranger because we were strangers in the land of Egypt. And then we, we have our own experience of oppression and the Holocaust just in our mm -hmm. history that should cause us to make sure that that doesn't happen to anyone else. Mm -hmm. Now, Trua is, does this work in this country also based in Israel, Correct. not based in any other countries at this point? Is that something you're looking to do, expand beyond those two, or that's enough work? Mm -hmm. It's enough right work. Right now, there's <laughs> a lot of work right now to do. And, um, do you, yeah. you know, we pick our campaigns carefully. We want them to be campaigns that Jewish people you know, feel an emotional, spiritual connection to, and where we can mm -hmm. have an impact as rabbis. Mm -hmm. So... What are you doing in Israel? So are yeah. you perceived as fair-minded when it comes to the whole Palestinian-Israeli dispute? Um, mm -hmm. when, I, when I was involved in a more liberal congregation in the Upper West Side, we were always known as the pro-Palestinian congregation, mm -hmm. you know. So how do you find that... Are you Looking for a balance there, being concerned with both sides of the conflict. Or what's your work there? Just Absolutely, us. we definitely uh -huh. are trying to be balanced. Um, we we work on behalf of the human rights of all the inhabitants of the state of Israel and the occupied territories, um, and we have campaigns related to Arab Israeli citizens. For instance, the Bedouin and the Negev, and issues of being pushed out of their lands because their villages are not so officially people, recognized. Yeah. Give um, people background on that. So. Um, the Bedouin, we tend to think of Bedouin as nomads, not having roots in any particular place, but it's actually not accurate. Mm -hmm. um, the Bedouin in the Negev of the State of Israel, um, they've been living in the same kind of areas. They have ancestral cemeteries that go back generations. Mm -hmm. um, and when the state was created, and ever since, uh, there's, there's a certain number of Bedouin villages, you can call them, settlements, that have not been recognized by the government. Um, Why? Well, it's, that's a great question. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's really, it's, it's a strategy of, mm -hmm. of the Israeli government to, to be able to do with, uh, to be able to have access to whatever lands they want to do what they need to do, mm -hmm. whether it's for military purposes or to plant a JNF forest mm -hmm. or, to work, you know, so um, it, it's to their advantage to kind of, to not recognize those villages so that they don't, they also don't have to provide uh, public schools or utilities or roads or, or garbage pickup or anything like anything like that and then they're able to then say well this isn't a real village we need this space for something else mm -hmm. we're gonna move this population to another place mm -hmm. um, so for those of us who who love Israel have been there Christians Jews whatever we think of it as an ideal and hopefully it was created on an ideal but those of us who've been there who study it know it's not quite there yet Correct. There's issues, and it's a young state. Um, how do we, from living here, I've always wondered about this. We put out suggestions about how, what Israel should do, what settlements they should give up, but we're not there. 
and we don't have to face the consequence. So almost like when someone tells you what to do in your relationship, you know, they're not in the relationship. Mm -hmm. So who are they to tell you? So is that a sensitive topic to when we give advice to Israel, whatever to do? Yeah. When, if you want to give us suggestions, you live here. You know what I'm saying? Do we face that? That's that is a sensitive topic. <laughs> I mean, I think the, this is my, my heart, my, you know, the home of my heart is Israel mm -hmm. as a Jew. As an American mm -hmm. Jew, I'm very proud to be a citizen here. Mm -hmm. um, I love my country and I feel empowered to criticize it. And, to, mm -hmm. and I feel like I want to make it a better place. And I feel that same urge when it comes mm -hmm. to the state of Israel. Um, so I, I guess, I mean, I guess that's my answer. Um, mm. Do we have a yeah. justification it's, in that we give so much money to Israel that they should have sort of listened to American Jews because without all that influx of money, uh, they wouldn't be doing quite as well? I mean, is there that argument? Um, we buy influence in a certain yeah, sense. Yeah, we do have a lot of influence. Yeah. yeah. Um, but I think we have a stake in it. We have a stake in it as American Jews in, in what, mm -hmm. you know, how Israel is perceived by the world. But also just to get back to, you know, how, how do we get involved in another country's affairs? Yeah. Yeah. It's actually very similar to, say, working with uh, a coalition of tomato pickers. I'm not picking those tomatoes. You know, I'm, mm -hmm. I'm not in that industry. Okay. Um, I can't speak for them, but I can be their ally. And similarly, when it comes to campaigns that we're doing in Israel and occupied territories, we're not just going in there on our own saying, we know all about this and we know how to fix mm -hmm. it. We have wonderful allies and partners who live in Israel, who are right. Israeli citizens, who are doing the work. Mm -hmm. um, and we're not telling them what to do. We're listening and we're working alongside as allies, mm -hmm. providing the kind of power and the kind of influence that perhaps a North American group of rabbis can provide for a larger campaign that's on the ground in mm -hmm. Israel. Mm -hmm. Do you find that the majority of people you work with in your congregation support the work that you do and that they're on board? How have you you've gotten them on board through this kind of storytelling and visual? I mean, in a sense, mm -hmm. you've expanded their horizons, right? Because people who live in the suburbs, well, with generalization, unless you're out there <laughs> traveling and seeing these things up close, you know, and seeing starvation in certain countries or seeing oppressive mm -hmm regimes or the consequences of like a gas attack in Syria. Mm -hmm. It's just on the news and it's something you can switch off, switch on. It's almost like it's not really happening. Mm -hmm. So how do you bring that to them without shocking them? You know, and, yeah, you know, yeah. especially it. <laughs> when it comes to Israel, it's, I have to be very careful mm -hmm. um, to what I try to do is, for instance, I, I was on a rabbinic mission um, with Rabbis for Human Rights. Mm -hmm. Okay, It was a joint North American Trua mission hosted by Rabbis for Human Rights in That's Israel. That's another group? Oh, ago. in Israel. Okay, okay. Yeah, and there, there we work with them on many issues. We used to be the same organization, and we, we've mm -hmm. separated, but we still are partners. Uh, um, and, you know, I saw, I saw really intense things. We visited Hebron. We, we watched what a checkpoint looks like with uh, Palestinians trying to come in for work from Ramallah into East Jerusalem and those kinds of things. And in telling, choosing how I want to tell the stories to my congregants, I try to focus on the activists in Israel, the Jewish activists in Israel who are Zionists, who believe in their country, who want Israel to be a Jewish state, and who are doing this human rights work on behalf of Palestinians, for instance, mm. which can seem very controversial to an American Jew. But you see an Israeli who served in the army, yeah. you know, um, who is incredibly loyal, who might even wear a kippah, who's religious, who is taking this group of North American rabbis through the streets of Hebron to learn about the issues of, of Jewish settlements. And mm -hmm. if, I, if I hear it through his, you know, his eyes, tell the story through his eyes, that helps people hear it more is, easily. Is there a missing link there? Because, you know, if the Palestinian leadership doesn't always serve their uh, constituents to the best of their ability, or there's corruption, or there's mm -hmm. Abbas who stays on and on, or there's Hamas that builds the roads but then blows up Israeli at the same time. So how do you how do you explain mm -hmm. all that complexity to American Jews, and how do you make them see both sides and not just see one side? Mm -hmm. You know, I mean. what I try to say is, you know, where do we, where can we actually make a difference? Okay, mm -hmm. as American Jews. I don't really think I have much of an impact on, on the Palestinian Authority, mm -hmm. right? I don't, they're not listening to me. Um, so when I get challenges like, well, the, you know, they're the other people, the Palestinians, they're not doing their job. I say, I, you know, I agree with you. There are areas where they're falling short. I'd really like a stronger partner for peace. But I'm an American Jew. My influence is really on the Israelis. That's where my heart is. And that, 
you know, so that that's mm -hmm. the side, if there's a side, you know, that I'm working on. Um, Since you've been there, I got to ask you this question: mm -hmm. that Palestinian Palestine was mm -hmm. before Israel, nineteen pre nineteen forty eight. Jews who lived there were called Palestinians because mm -hmm. they were residents of Palestine. Um, do Palestinian do Arabs living in that part of the world call themselves Palestinians? In other words, or is that just a, ter a term that's been applied to them? Most people don't know that. Yeah, yeah. So do they call themselves that? Well, there's an that? interesting history to that <laughs> the identity. Right. Yeah. Right. Um, <laughs> I, I just heard this from another Israel educator, mm -hmm. and I really appreciated the way he put it. Um, that nationalism, you know, Jewish nationalism, which became Zionism, actually influenced Palestinian nationalism. There wasn't a Palestinian mm -hmm. nationalism nationalist movement until there was a Zionist movement. Mm -hmm. um, but that doesn't mean it's not an authentic movement and an authentic national identity to have. Mm -hmm. um, so okay. my experience, more and more, is that Palestinians living in the occupied territories for sure identify as Palestinians. Arab citizens of the state of Israel more and more identify as Palestinians as well. Mm. They are happy to be, for the most part, happy to be citizens of Israel because they're living very good lives there for the most part in, in comparison to yeah. the rest of the Arab world, but they identify with the Palestinian national struggle. Does it, does it bother you? It's bothered me, and I'll start this way as a, as a Jewish American, that when I see you know, people, I mean, for years, for example, in Syria, we talked about it, mm -hmm. that you had an oppressive regime that was anti-Israel and so forth, and now there's a chance maybe to replace it with a more democratic regime or stop the oppression. Mm -hmm. Where are the human rights people in Israel saying, well, we have to help the civilians of Syria fight off um, an, an oppressive regime that's trying to keep them? And is, is that such a delicate issue because any mm. teetering on the balance in Syria could ultimately be detrimental to Israel? Yes. So you have to think outside the box. You can't just yeah. with your heart. I mean, that's always... Yeah, no, I agree, <laughs> especially when you're living in that kind of a neighborhood. Mm -hmm. um, I have to be honest, I, I'm not so familiar with What's Neither going on in the Israeli human asking. rights community related to Syria? But yes. Well, talk about you know, talk about, for example, your work with the kids in mm -hmm. the Hebrew schools and so mm -hmm. forth. You mm -hmm. know, um, how do you influence this kind of work with them in such a way that they're open to it, they're exploring it, mm -hmm. um, they're seeing all different sides, and 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 their families okay with it, with it right. being in, in, integrated into the Jewish curriculum and Jewish um, study. Yeah. So far, so good. I mean, we, mm -hmm. we educate in a general sense around the ideas of tzedakah, mm -hmm. of, of, just, of tzedek, of justice, of mm -hmm. giving, um, of helping others, of tikkun olam, repairing the world. And then I found that, especially this Saturday, it's very fresh in my mind, um, having the parents there learning along with their kids is very powerful. Mm -hmm. um, and it's, so it's not just the kids coming home and saying, oh, the rabbi taught us about these slaves in Immokalee, Florida, but the parents mm -hmm. heard the stories too. Um, and, and what we were able to do, uh, if, if you don't mind me kind of no. going into this, and this, this week is actually a week of action on Wendy's, which is one of the last fast food restaurants that has not signed the, fa the fair food agreement, which basically um, raises the wages of tomato workers and um, institutes a code of conduct for the growers so that they're protected and they're getting paid for their work. And, Abuse is something they can now, they're accountable for. Um, there's an outside monitoring group that, that holds growers accountable to this. So, um, so that's going on this week. We're, we're working to urge Wendy's restaurants to sign on to the fair food agreement. Um, so I educated about this. I told the stories. I had the kids pick up 32, a 32 pound bucket to see what that feels like and that you'd have to pick that up and carry it 153 times to make minimum mm -hmm. wage mm -hmm. in the 10 hour day, for instance. Mm -hmm. You know, they feel it. And then it was, it was a wonderful opportunity to be able then the very next day on Sunday, we went to Wendy's in Guilford. And 18, I think it shows that, the, the, it, that I did have an impact. 18 parents and kids showed up at Wendy's with fair food signs and tomatoes. Mm. And, um, and we delivered a whole stack of letters to the manager and educated her about this issue. Mm. And, she probably and had no clue. She really, she didn't, and in fact, I, I want to thank Stephanie at the Guilford, uh, the Guilford Wendy's because um, she was willing to listen to us, which not everyone is. Mm. Um, but these were children from my son who's in first grade up through, you know, sixth graders mm -hmm. that were there with their parents. 
Um, so I, you know, I think when you start from the basis of Jewish values and show how it's rooted in who we are, um, and you tell stories about real people that are suffering, and then there's a, a strategy that's working, that's effective, that they can be a part of locally, it's been an amazing experience. The last president that I can think of in my lifetime, unless I miss something, who talked about human rights, who really tried to address this issue, who said we can't work on trade issues with some of these countries mm. until they um, fix it, like in China, was Jimmy Carter. And I yeah. was 12 years old. He was the first one, I recall, speaking about this. I don't recall anyone speaking about it since in that level of government, even including Obama, unless I'm missing something. So is the, I mean, I know Clinton has this foundation in Africa and his daughter runs it, Amy runs it, and, uh, not Amy. Chelsea. His daughter, Chelsea. Mm -hmm. Right. So do you see, sure. the, do you want more support from governmental agencies, mm. the UN? Where's the UN? Right, right. Well, mm -hmm. actually, with this issue of human trafficking, um, mm -hmm. starting with the George W. Bush administration, we've had mm -hmm. a lot of... Uh, willingness to act and pass legislation, anti-trafficking legislation. Um, and TRUA has been working with the White House, um, which has endorsed uh, the Coalition of Immokalee Workers Fair Food Agreement. So um, it may not have made big headlines. It may not have made it into the State of the Union address. Mm -hmm. That would be nice. Right. Um, but. But we are, we, we actually have kind of found our way to the table mm -hmm. in this administration. Um, so it's very exciting. Um, That's great. Yeah, yeah. In fact, I believe that the, uh, I don't know if it was the White House, it was, there was a, a big Passover Seder uh, last year um, with the administration officials who were present where Rabbi Rachel Contraster from Trua, I believe, was present as well. And they had a tomato on their Seder plate, which is one of the things that we bring in. Um, mm. as a reminder of modern-day slavery. So. Mm -hmm. Now, there's that tradition of putting the orange on the Seder plate. Yeah. You know about that? Yes. Wait, should we, That's another wonderful that? human rights issue. <laughs> um, right. Yeah. I mean, the, it's, well, it, it has morphed. Um, the orange on the Seder plate originally, originally was meant to be um, about gay and lesbian inclusion in the Jewish community, and it became morphed into a feminist issue and uh -huh. a women's issue, but that's actually not the origin of it. I heard some so guy said to be a, about a woman rabbi belongs as much as, her, as an orange on a Seder plate. And so that's how they started. To, yeah, that's, that the like that? that's, that's the myth. That's the myth. So ah. if, you, if you look it up, because um, <laughs> rabbi, uh, Susanna Heschel, the daughter of Abraham Joshua Heschel, um, she was, I think she's the one who, who figured into that mythical ah. story, and she's cleared things up. Now, actually, originally, a radical lesbian group was putting was advocating putting bread on the Seder plate to show just how um, countercultural it was at that time for gays and lesbians to be welcome in the synagogue. That it would, that, and and it, it kind of morphed into an orange, and then there was this, I don't know, this mm -hmm. story that, that made it about women on the bima, which takes the spotlight oh, off right. of right. the gay and lesbian issue, no, which is no really idea. the issue. Yeah, no yeah. So. What what brought you into the rabbinate? I mean, um, mm -hmm. historically, well, yeah. as, as in your generation, it's been more of a, a female profession. Historically, mm -hmm. it was a male profession. Now it's in the reform movement. I think it's half and half, or maybe more. Uh, yeah. You know. Yeah. So what what brought you? What inspired you to mm -hmm. to want to do this kind of work? Well, I grew up the daughter of a reform rabbi. First of all, mm -hmm. my father, Erwin Goldenberg, is was the reform rabbi in uh, York, Pennsylvania, for thirty five years, where I grew up, and it was a beautiful experience to grow up at, with the synagogue as my second home and and see how meaningful the work was for him. Um, and I, he was very and continues to be very involved with social justice, which has always been a pillar of my rabbinate. So. Um, being able to bring together the elements of social justice and spirituality um, and, and Jewish teaching um, is really what brought me to the rabbinate. But I, I had wonderful um, female role models as well along the way, and I think without that, I'm not sure I would have been here. You know, mm -hmm. even though, you know, I guess the first woman rabbi was ordained three years before I was born, there weren't many female rabbi role models for me growing mm -hmm. up. Um, but I had a wonderful role model at Columbia University. Rabbi Sue Oren was the associate Jewish chaplain when I was there. That, that made a big difference for me to see. Mm -hmm. you know, There's something called the Pew Report. We won't go into that in detail. Uh, but it's yeah. sort of going into how 
you know, young people are not joining anything. They don't join yeah. bowling leagues anymore. They don't join the Rotary. They don't join sisterhoods. They're just not joiners. They mm. want to kind of do it themselves. So there's a sense of, of crisis, as I understand it, in American mm. Jewish, maybe in the religion in general. The churches are going empty. Right. Synagogues are going empty. Right. So is that a byproduct of people failing religion, or are we leaders overall failing people, not inspiring them or bringing them in? Is it just a cultural thing? And how do we, mm. how do we reverse it? Can we reverse it? Mm. Should we? Yeah. Is it a natural trend? I think we shouldn't be so hard on ourselves. Mm -hmm. and, and I think you know, the mm -hmm. negativity around this and the crisis rhetoric around it um, and the fear, I, I find that that doesn't help. I, I think that, um, look, these are the statistics for whatever reason. There's a change going on. There's a change going on in how people express themselves spiritually in this culture and in this country. And I think we need to be responsive to it. That's it. You know, I think as religious leaders, as religious institutions, we have to respond to what's going on in the, in the broader community. And if it means that I need to be, for instance, I'm doing this, if I need to go out into the community and bring Judaism outside the walls of the synagogue, you know, Rabbi Stacy Offner from Beth Tikva in Madison and I are co-teaching an introductory to Judaism class at the Clinton Library in, this winter. That's you a know, great idea. And, and we're trying to get mm -hmm. it publicized in the secular press. You know, I, I think the question these days is not um, how to be Jewish or how to be religious. It's why. Why? And yeah. we need to be able to answer that question. And we need to have that conversation with people. I'm, I'm concerned that sometimes we still follow that message of teaching young people that, you know, watch out, we've been victims, anti-Semitism, mm -hmm. almost trying to scare people into being Jewish. And I've always felt that that it didn't work for me. Yeah. So I know it didn't work for me when I was younger, and I'm like, I don't think it's a great model. I mean, yeah, we have to be aware of it, but right. I don't think it's the way to, to get people to get involved is, you know, they might hate us, so be Jewish. you got to show people the joy and the meaning mm -hmm. that a religious community can bring to their lives. Yeah. 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 My guest has been Rabbi Rachel Goldenberg of Trua, the rabbinic call for human rights. So Trua is one of the calls that we do on the, when we blow the shofar. Um, and it's the broken sound doo -doo 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 mm -hmm. that we blow on Rosh Hashanah. Mm -hmm. um, and it's meant to be a call for justice and a call for healing of the brokenness of our world. Beautiful. And your congregation So my congregation is, is Beth Shalom Rodfei Tzedek in Chester. And I'm Kander Mark Perman, FEGC Emek Shalom. Thank you for joining us on the Interfaith Roundtable. And thanks to Jason and Phyllis and Karen in the control room. We'll see you next time. Funding for Simsbury Community Television is provided in part by contributions from viewers like you. Thank you.